Hey guys, what's up? Aru. So, we saved Scaramouche from deleting himself, Nahida reveals secrets about Teyvat, and now we have another voice in our head that isn't Paimon. Or is it? But a huge problem that makes any lore player shake with uncontrollable fear is the fact that any lore that isn't written allegorically is now even more questionable than that of a children's book. It's as if everything Hoyo gave us was useless all along. So, welcome to another video of someone who won't stop talking. You don't want to be like this. This video is gonna be about allegorical books, what it is, what makes it allegorical, which lore in Genshin has hidden meaning inside of it, and a short speculation on what a certain allegorical book could mean. Bear in mind that this video will not talk about a specific book because we're only going to cover which lore may or may not be allegorical depending on how it's written. A quick warning if you have zero clue about what Ermin Sol does, what happens with history, or why allegorical books are so prevalent now, you might want to watch my previous video first, or at least get up to speed with the current lore. So as always, timestamps will be down in the description. Now, let's get started. The word allegory is a narrative or visual representation in which a character, place, or event can be interpreted to represent a hidden meaning. This is finished with the use of moral or political significance, but that will not be part of our discussion. Allegory, in short, is a form of symbolism, with the main difference being symbolism is used to make abstract ideas easier to understand, like an X mark meaning no, or treasure, or maybe a skull meaning death or danger. Allegory, on the other hand, is used to convey a hidden message using a story or a narrative. This story usually has fake names or aliases as well as events that are used to portray or mean something else. If you put these two together in an allegorical book, you will see lots of symbolisms of one thing representing the other. So now that we know what an allegory means, let's walk you through the countless lore in Genshin that may or may not be counted as allegories. We have fairy tales, legends, myths, narratives, poetry, songs, parables, and even proverbs, as well as others that I might have missed. All of these types of lore more or less can fall under what we call folklore, which everyone might think is allegorical, which is not true. Now I'm gonna take some time explaining how all of this works because I wouldn't want you guys to start spamming discords and reddits and claim that literally any fairy tale or type of folklore in Genshin is an allegory, which is the last thing that anyone who hasn't lost to erosion wants to happen. Folklore, from the words folk and lore, are stories or tales that are passed down through generations of a certain group of people. And folklore usually is told using real-world settings and events, with the main focus being to preserve the history that our ancestors experiences and pass it on to the next generation through either storytelling or some form of story writing. Some folklore, however, are written in a fictional setting as well as written to be more entertaining for children to understand and remember. But of all the types of folklore that I've mentioned, very few are completely allegorical like how Genshin made the cat's tale. It is explained to us right off the bat that the Balladeer cat fairy tale was about Scaramouche. Compared to real life fairy tales like maybe Beauty and the Beast, which if you look up allegories about it, you'll find many allegorical explanations, but none can really say that it was the point of the story. In a sense, allegory can be any type of folklore, but not all folklore is an allegory. Furthermore, allegorical books have hidden meaning, but it would take some time to find which allegory the story actually meant. So why don't we take some examples of real folklore and use Genshin's lore to represent how each of them is used and in what context they can be used. Poetry in and of itself is already an allegory. That's just how they're made. And any song made with poetry is the perfect way for our drunk god of freedom to create whatever allegorical ballad he wishes. Even winds and time are synonymous with each other, which is already an allegory. This sort of poetry, in my opinion, is Venti's genius strategy to avoid the heavenly principles. With how Venti writes his ballads, you'll notice how he never really mentioned the characters' names, as well as the way his poetry makes 
makes whatever he's implying very vague and unclear. Although he did mention titles and callings, the specific names of characters were never openly spoken. His use of figurative speech and rhetorics to mask historical events in such a way that seems like a fairy tale makes it unchangeable. For example, the Four Winds cutscene. If you were a merchant who knows nothing about history and only knows about sales, and you didn't see this cinematic here, you might say, well, wow, that was a cool poem. I wonder what that bard meant when he blank, 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 and so on and so forth. This implies that anyone who doesn't know specific history or people who won't know the characters, despite Venti mentioning their titles, would still remember how the actual story went. If you forget the name Vanessa, then the Lion Fang story wouldn't disappear from your memory and it wouldn't change because of how Venti writes his story. If you forget the Lion Fang, then Vanessa's story would still be remembered. Venti's way of writing his poetry hides the characters' names as well as writing events in a way to still be relevant no matter how much history has changed. So it's safe to say that the God of Freedom knows what he's doing. The easiest way to explain other folklore without making this video too long is with the records of Jue Yun. Granted it's not allegorical, this collection specifically helps you guys differentiate the types of folklore and helps me explain folklore and allegory to you guys in a more cohesive manner. I do suggest that you guys read it at least once before continuing with this video, but I digress. Folktale, which is a part of the narrative genre of folklore, are stories passed down from word of mouth usually in a real world setting as well as using real world events. Folktale specifically is a story written with morals in mind, as well as taking a very realistic approach in its storytelling. Just like the sea god that warned her bride about the village's elders, and that she would regret going back home from the palace of the sea god. Legends are stories of the past that are believed by many but cannot be proven true. Usually made through claims and stories from one place to another, these stories often circulate around a certain area and are passed down through word of mouth or made into adaptations in writing. Hence the legends about the Chi Lin, Seelies, as well as the Dunyu Ruins and the Chasm. Urban legends, which are stories that are generally taken from hearsay and just circulated around as true but aren't really proven either. Stories about the Wu Wang Hills malevolent spirits could be an example of this. Fables are a narrative form of folklore, usually having animals that behave and speak like normal humans. Fables are told in a way to highlight human weakness and folly, along with a moral lesson of a story that is often made very apparent to the reader, which reflects the people disappearing into the Bishui River, enticed with the false promises of a faraway sea monster's whale-like song. Mythologies fall into the beliefs and religion areas of folklore and are typically used to explain supernatural phenomena. Some myths may be factual in origin and storytelling while some are entirely fictional with moral lessons. Stories from Wu Wang Hill highlighting prudence and the spirits that punish prudent travelers I think are one such example. Now after what I've just said, folk tales, myths, fables, and a lot of the other folklore are all sitting precariously on a line between fantasy and reality, which makes it hard to tell what part of the story might be changed or will be changed depending on who or what disappears from the Ermin Souls records, because that's just how these folklore are written. Fairy tales, however, are completely on the fictional side, which is the biggest distinction from other folklore. Other forms of folklore from Genshin use names that are known in the world of Tavat itself. But with fairy tales, you have names that aren't related to anything in the game at all. Fairy tales often are written in a fantastical setting with otherworldly details and events that don't match anything that happens in real life. One of the main focuses of fairy tales lean a bit more on entertainment rather than the informative aspects of writing, which makes it the perfect place to put an allegory, and I hate it because of that. One example of a fairy tale from Genshin is Vera's Melancholy, which is an odd Rick and Morty sci-fi book which is completely random considering Teyvat is still on its medieval to renaissance era. I'll only go over a few 
allegorical bits, but this book has a lot of possible allegorical statements, just like the Scaramouche story. First off, it mentions the actual word Greek mythology, which technically shouldn't be part of Genshin's lore at all, nor should the author of this book know about this term. Next is Sachi, who is the childhood friend of Vera that for some reason has a Japanese name as to a Greek name, like Vera does, which might go back to Enkonomiya where people change their names from Greek to Japanese when they were allowed to go to the surface to join Inazuma. The princess, possibly being a Sele or Peck the God of Flowers, considering the princess was going to marry Ike, mirroring the story of a Sele that fell in love with a traveler. Along with three stars exploding after Ike wakes up, which could mean the fall of the three moon sisters after a mere 30 days of the traveler and the Sele being married. The Andromeda Empire's organs that look like lampreys that can for some reason take eyeballs could mean the sustainer and the cube magic that she controls with her hands and the eyeballs possibly being visions or elemental energy. Next is mentioning that the past cannot change the future, which connects with how Ermansel can affect Tavat's history not changing no matter what you do. Finally, Easteroth being connected to how much Vera, Sachi, and Ike know about time. I might sound either very smart or very dumb depending on how you interpret the book, but that's just the point of allegory itself and it shows just how much allegory could be found in Vera's melancholy. Parables fall under the religious or belief side of folklore. These types of stories are used to portray a moral attitude or a religious principle. Parables often provide an example or portray a lesson or attitude that is taught by that belief. The parables in Before the Sun and Moon, The Lethal Lotus, and The Parable of the Sun are such examples. With the one takeaway being the parable of the tree, which may or may not be an allegorical parable. Which goes back to my previous point that all allegories can be any type of folklore, but not all folklore is an allegory. Honestly, Hoyo can just change every book that isn't labeled as a fairy tale if they wanted to. Hopefully, they don't. But this is as far as allegorical books and folklore goes. If you watch until this point, then props to you, but you might now think, well, Aru, every book that isn't allegorical is basically useless, right? Well, to me, no. Not exactly. See, there's another possible way to record history without Ermensol having to erase it or change it, at least for some time. And that's from a character quest way back in patch 1.2 or 1.1. Zhongli's character quest Sal Flore, if you can still remember, was a foreshadowing of history changing. A follower of Havria, Wan Yan, believed that Morax assassinated Havria but the quest revealed that what her ancestors passed down to her were completely wrong, similar to Ermensol changing history or people's memory of history changing. In Sal Flore's final chapter, A Record of All Things, Zhongli mentions that the Salt God's history has been changed and that he needs to find a better way to record history. He then continues to mention that stone carvings are one such way. Sadly, he also says that stone and the immovable earth, just like himself affected by erosion, can and will someday disappear. Since erosion of stone is similar to how memory is lost over time, anything you write on stones will someday fade because the stones themselves are prone to deterioration. And the same can be said for anyone in Tavat losing memories over time. But this means that stone carvings can be done to save and record real history without having to be changed by the Ermensal's technicalities. Stone carvings are prevalent in many ancient ruins, for example, Surumi and Dragonspine, and are pretty much scattered throughout every region in Tavat. But this is especially prevalent in Enkanomiya. The Byako Yakoku collection, as well as other books in Enkanomiya, are all written in stone, so it's possible that every written text there is not affected by Ermensol. And I also find it very interesting that the Lord of Geo and the God of Contracts also mentions contracts being set in stone. Metaphorically or allegorically, this could mean Zhongli keeps every contract as historical records, but maybe Zhongli was just being rhetorical. This, I think, is Zhongli's way of keeping the truths of Tavat's history. Stone carvings and history, however, open up the question in regards to whether lore from ascension gems are changeable or not. Since gemstones are technically ore, and we know that certain types of stones can retain great levels of memory. In Zhongli's character quest about Ejdaha, we find 
find a geological analyst named Kunjun who can apparently read stones and do something called stone seeing, according to Zhong Li. The quest description even says memories embedded in stone. But again, as Zhong Li mentioned before, Kunjun also says that the memories that ore can hold is also affected by erosion, which means that those memories that the stones can hold will someday disappear. The question now stands, can ascension gems hold memory indefinitely or do they also fall for erosion? Maybe even a bigger question for the brilliant diamond which is used for the traveler's ascension. For the traveler's ascension, I don't think Erminsel can change it but as for elemental gems, we can't say just yet. Now, including Venti's ballads and Nahira's use of dreams and allegory, A and Makoto's Sakura tree using eternity could also be a form of preserving truth, since Makoto created the Sakura tree which avoids the heavenly principles' loss. But each of the Archon's way of avoiding Erminsul's historical changes are something that I'll save for a different video. Memories, ideals, and history being recorded into things also come with one of the essential and most often discussed things in game, both meta-wise and lore-wise. And it's something that we've been using and have been farming since we first entered the game. Artifacts Artifact lore in itself does not have much lore, but it does make sense that they come from domains, specifically from ermine soul branches. Artifacts are physical manifestations of ideals and memories, and each memory and ideal we find from each of these artifacts speak of a certain person or a group of people in an unknown time. Whether or not the owner had these artifacts themselves or they are actually manifestations of memories, we can't say, but the opulent husk set has pieces that Skaramush himself carries in his person. The overall aesthetic, however, of the artifact doesn't exactly look the same, so we can at least assume that artifacts are physical manifestations and serve as a representation of a person's memory at that moment in time. Using something called sanctifying essence or simply leveling up your artifact allows that artifact piece's memory to become clearer and stronger, similar to how elemental gemstones, again, of different sizes contain varying levels of information and memory. Basically, the higher the level your artifact or your stone, the clearer the memory you can find. So level up your artifacts, everyone. Having said that, it's possible that at some point in the game, the artifacts similar to gems might also lose memory the longer we have it, considering artifacts come from Urminsul itself and and the Erminsul can change history from Tavad. And there we go, a little introduction to folklore and allegories, a sort of guideline for you guys on which book may or may not be allegorical, and finally a speculation on one of the famous allegorical books of Genshin. This video was a real head shake considering the multitude of books, stories, and tales that can be deemed as allegorical. Honestly, I was more curious about the differences between folklore than the allegories themselves. But yes, I do hope that you guys enjoyed this first of the year lore slash theory video on my channel. I can't take up any more of your time with this outro, but if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment what you guys think about the video. Lastly, subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on my channel. So again, thanks for watching, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's, and I'll see you guys on the next video, yeah? Like, comment if you enjoyed, subscribe for more ramblings, and stay mad theorists. Bye!